بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله ما بعد أعوذ بالله السميع العليم من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم لقد كفر الذين قالوا إن الله هو المسيح ابن مريم وقال المسيح يا بني إسرائيل أعبد الله ربي وربكم إنه من يشرك بالله فقد حرم الله عليه الجنة ومأواه النار وما للظالمين من أنصار لقد كفر الذين قالوا إن الله إن الله ثالث الثلاثة So, brothers and sisters in Islam, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Today's topic is an interesting topic indeed. This topic is one of the bones of contentions between the Christians and the Muslims and the Jews. The Jews and the Muslims insist that the Christians, majority of the Christians, not all of them of course, have got it wrong about the doctrine of the Trinity. They have misunderstood or they have concocted, they have forged something, an idea, a notion of Godhead which cannot be substantiated from the scriptures. On the other hand, the Christians insist that the doctrine of the Trinity originates from the scripture from the New Testament and some even go as far as to suggest that it can be found in the Old Testament. And this is why this debate about the doctrine of the Trinity has been ensuing for almost 1700 years. Because prior to the 4th century the doctrine of the Trinity wasn't even established as the firm the central Christian doctrine. The Christian doctrine was still being debated up to the 4th century. There were different Christians alive in the 4th century and in the 3rd century, in the 2nd and the 1st century who had different doctrines, different ways of understanding Jesus Christ and different ways of understanding God Almighty and His nature. But it was only in the 4th century when the doctrine of the Trinity was put down as an established church doctrine, the Catholic doctrine, the Catholic view of God or on God Almighty. So how do the, does the Catholic Church understand God in the 4th century, especially after the year 381 CE when in the Council of Constantinople some bishops they came together and they redefined the Creed of Nicaea. The Creed of Nicaea was a creed, was a statement, a doctrinal statement which was written down in the year 325 CE in a council held in a place called Nicaea. And in this council that the Emperor Constantine, Constantine the Great known as otherwise, was present. He was residing in this conference and he took an active part in the running of this conference. And in this conference the outcome was, right or wrong is another debate altogether, the outcome was that Jesus is God from very God. Jesus is God in flesh. And He is of the same essence as the Father with capital F. So the Jews previously in the Old Testament, they were worshipping one God who was one person, a God who was unipersonal, not tripersonal, not consisting of three persons because the doctrine of the Trinity as it stands today and as it was established in the 4th century stipulated that God is one, He has one being but that one being consists of three persons. So that God manifests Himself in three persons and the first person of that Godhead is the Father with capital F, the second is the Son with capital S and the Spirit, the Holy Spirit with capital H and capital S. So two persons, two extra persons were added into Godhead 
in the 4th century. How did this happen? And why did this happen? This is the question I will be addressing today. The doctrine of the Trinity, divinely revealed or man-made? What is it? Did Allah, did God, did Yahweh, or the father of the Israelites, did He mean to reveal this doctrine? Or was it made up later on by early Christian church fathers? How did this doctrine come about? And I will be giving some academic references in due course so that you can take some notes, those who want to take notes, and check, inshallah. The Quran revealed in the 7th century to a man who was born in the desert in a settlement known as Mecca. This man, when he was 40 years old, he received a revelation from God Almighty, so he claimed. He claimed that he is a prophet of God. Why? Because he received the revelation which told him that he is a prophet of God. And not only that, when he went to the people of scripture, people like Waraka bin Nofal, when he told him as to what happened in the cave, the cave of Hira, where an angel appeared to him and told him, read in the name of your Lord, who has taught you the use of pen, who has taught you what you knew not. And now he goes to this man, the man of scriptures in the city of Mecca, Waraka bin Nofal, who was known for his learning in Jewish and Christian scriptures. He hears the story of Muhammad وسلم, who was 40 at the time, and he tells him, This is the same angel, same spirit who came to Moses. And he said, Ya laytani fiha jaza'an. In this there is a great news. Laytani an akuna hayyan is yukhriju wa I wish that I was alive on that day when your people will drive you out. Our mukhrijiyahum, they will drive me out. The Prophet of Islam, Prophet Muhammad was shot. They will drive me out. Why? What have I done? I'm one of the most peaceful people in the city. I've never harmed anyone. And if anything, I help people. I help the poor. I always support the meek and the weak. Why would they drive me out? Waraka tells him that anyone who came with this similar message, his people went against him. Because he was aware of the history of Jesus, the history of Moses, the history of Abraham, the history of Noah, all these people when they came with this message. And what was the message? La ilaha illallah. Qulu la ilaha illallah wa tuflihu. When people came with this message, they were persecuted, they were driven out. And now he received this revelation, and in this revelation, he is told subsequently that those are blasphemers who say that Jesus, the son of Mary, is God. This was a shock for the Christians who were alive at the time and the Jews. Now this man was not a theologian. Muhammad وسلم, had never been to a school, had never studied the Bible, wasn't known to have been a man of literature or a man of letters, and yet he is receiving this revelation, many many powerful verses explaining, documenting the doctrine and the mistakes and the errors of the Jews and the Christians and those who worship idols and those who worship their desires such as atheists. Explaining the errors of all of these people in this book being revealed to a man who had never been to an academy, never taught, never learnt and all of a sudden these verses are coming down on him and he is describing and explaining the stories of those who lived in the past. سيروا في الأرض فانظروا كيف كان عاقبة للمكذبين. Go in the land and see what happened to those who lived before you. All the monuments you see around you, the people of Al Aram Tar, Aram Tar, كيف فعل ربك بعاد. إرمذات العمال التي لم يخلق مثلها في البلاد. وثمود الذين جابوا الصخرة بالواد. وفرعون ذي الأوتار. And all these stories are coming down on these people. Look at the Pharaoh. Look at those people of Al and Thamud, and look around you, people, and wake up. You've gone astray. You're making mistakes. You haven't misunderstood God. Do not worship other people beside Him. Don't refer to other people as gods. And one of the issues he dealt with, God Almighty in the Quran, was this very issue. The errors of Christianity. The errors of Christianity. Historically, historians today, modern historians, tell, are telling us what the Quran told us 14 centuries ago. Their conclusions today are that Jesus, if anything we can know about him for certain, 
is that he was a Jew, alive in the first century, who used to go to the temple and worship the Father as other Jews were worshipping their God. Period. And that's all they know about him today. And who is saying this? This is said by some of the major patristic authorities in the field who have studied the scriptures and the history of Christianity for centuries. For example, one of those people is James D. G. Dunn, who is alive today and he was teaching in the University of Durham and he holds a, a high place in academic circles when it comes to commenting on the history of first century Christianity and he's an authority, patristic authority and he states that the only fact we can establish for sure about Jesus Christ is that he was a Jew alive in the first century he went to the temple having known all we know about him from the Gospels and from the epistles of Paul and all the other writings and the, and the histories written about Jesus Christ and Christians that's all we can establish about him for sure that this is what he was and what does the Quran say? the Quran says exactly that that this was a messianic figure a prophet a messenger who came to the Israelites in the first century and told him to worship one God go back to that God and do not manipulate do not change do not twist your scriptures and do not play games with God rather go to God and worship him as he wants you to worship him this is what the Quran tells us وَقَالَ الْمَسِيحُ يَا بَنِي إِسْرَائِيلِ أُعْبُدُ اللَّهَ رَبِّي وَرَبَّكُمْ إِنَّهُ مَنْ يُشْرِكْ بِاللَّهِ فَقَدْ حَرَمَ اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ الْجَنَّةِ وَمَأْوَاهُ النَّارِ وَمَا لِلْظَالِمِينَ مِنْ أَنْصَارِ All the people of Israel, the children of Israel, worship one God, your Lord and my Lord. And anyone who ascribes partners with Him, his abode will be hellfire and he will not find any protectors and helpers. If you ascribe partners with them. And this is exactly what the Christians did, unfortunately. Hellenized Christians, Christians influenced by Greek thought, Greek mythology, Greek way of thinking, they turned a prophet of God into a God. And he wasn't a God. He was never a God, he never claimed to be, claimed to be God, and he, he in fact claimed to be a prophet of God, a Messiah, even in the scriptures. So where did the doctrine of the Trinity come from? The Quran condemns it. The Quran again in chapter 5 of the Quran, Surah Al Ma'idah, verse 72 onwards, the Quran talks about this. Those are blasphemers who say that Allah, God Almighty, is the third of the three. Yani, he's one of them. He's 33% of the Godhood, Godhead. Of course the Christians don't say that. The Christians say that God is 100% God, God the Father is 100% God, and God the Son is 100% God, and God the Spirit is also 100% God. But these are not three gods. This is one God. It doesn't make sense to even Christians. Okay? For this reason people like John Locke and Isaac Newton and Thomas Jefferson in America, they simply couldn't make sense of this doctrine not only philosophically, scripturally. They couldn't find this doctrine in the scripture. And they established, they concluded, having studied the scriptures for years, that this was a corruption in Christianity. This was put into Christianity, this was forced down people's throat by the Roman might for them to go away from the religion of God. The true religion of God, Newton writes in his secret writings, which are only revealed in the 1990s, that God is one and He is unipersonal. He is not tripersonal. Because God cannot be in three persons. That doesn't make sense. And this comes from the Greeks. Newton was a genius. What was published is known by Newton in his scientific writings, but he also wrote on theology. The writings he left behind Three million words were written on theology and one million words were written on science. And these writings only came to light in the 1990s. They were hidden. And Newton was thought to be a deist. Someone who believed in a power, a supreme power, who had made this world and he's like an absentee landlord. That's what Newton was thought to be. Or that was he, that, this is what he was thought to uh, have believed in. But he was not a deist, he was a theist. He believed that God 
created all of this and he's God with capital G and he takes an active part in the running of this universe which he termed as providence. So Newton broke away from this doctrine. He said this doctrine is a corruption and even the Bible was corrupted so we don't have the pure word of God. Newton, he wrote this and it was a science which made him believe in God, not his religion. Christianity, as far as his religion was concerned, he went away from it. It was a science which made him believe in God Almighty. So now, all of these people later on were studying the scriptures and the history of the doctrine of the church. They realized that this doctrine, it developed, it evolved. It wasn't there in the scripture. This doctrine didn't come down from God at once and then all, all the Christians in the world were believing in it. No, it didn't happen like that. The Quran is very, very true. Wallahi, the Quran is a miracle of Allah for this reason. Once you study the verses about the Trinity in the Quran, you get convinced that this has to be from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's a miracle of Allah. Because Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa couldn't have known all of this. Why? Because the Quran in chapter 4, verse 171 states, Qul, say, O Muhammad, say to them, Ya Ahl al-Kitab, all the people of scriptures, La taghlu fi dinikum. Do not transgress limits in your religion. Don't go to extremes in your religion. Wala taqulu ala illa al-haqq. And do not say about God except the truth. God is one God. And then Allah says in the Quran, same verse, Wala taqulu thalatha. Do not say three. Do not say three. Khairun lakum. Abstain from it. It will be better for you. Do not say it. Amin. Amanu billahi wa rasulih. Amanu billahi wa rusul. So Allah here is saying, believe in Allah and His messengers. In the same part of the verse, open the Quran, chapter 4, 171. Allah is saying here, do not say three and believe in Allah and His messengers. So what is the implication here? I want some help here. What is the implication here? First Allah is saying, do not say three. And then He says, Amanu billahi wa rasul. Amanu billahi wa rasul. Believe in Allah. And it and his messengers. What is the implication here? There's a dichotomy here. There is a dichotomy here. If you believe in the Trinity, then you don't believe in Allah and His messengers. And if you believe in Allah, uh, in Allah and His messengers, then you cannot believe in the Trinity. You see the dichotomy here in the Quran, in chapter four, hundred and seventy-one. Allah is saying, "Wala taqulu." Salah. Do not say Trinity. Do not say three. Why? Because you have to believe in Allah and His messengers. So when you believe in Allah and His messengers, you come to realize Jesus never preached a Trinity. Moses never preached a Trinity. Abraham never preached a Trinity. None of these people pre pre preached a Trinity. So where did the Trinity come from? The implication in the Quran is, uh, is that it is man-made. It was made. It was concocted. That's why I don't say it is better for you. Don't follow it. It's kufr. It's disbelief. People made it up. Allah never sent it. And this is the implication in the Quran. And this is why the Quran is a miracle in this regard. The Prophet couldn't have known this. How did he know whether Jesus Isa ever preached the Trinity or not? How would he know that in the 7th century? And he doesn't have any access to any scriptures, Jewish and Christian scriptures. And even if he did, he wouldn't have been able to read them because they were written in the Jewish and the Christian language. The Aramaic and Hebrew language. You know about that, right? In the time of the Prophet ﷺ, there were no Arabic books written. Arabic was simply an oral spoken language. There were no Arabic texts written down in any book form up to the time of the Prophet ﷺ. The first book ever written in Arabic language was the Quran. So even if the Prophet ﷺ had access to the Jewish and the Christian books, he simply wouldn't have been able to read them in Hebrew or Aramaic. He asked his companions, Zayd bin Thabit, to go and learn the language of the Jews so that we can converse, converse with them. So how do you know all these things? How did he know that the doctrine of the Trinity doesn't come from Allah and His messages? And Jesus never preached it. How do you know what Jesus was saying in the first century? So, does the doctrine of the Trinity come from man? Is it man-made? 
So when we go to the Bible, we don't find the doctrine of the Trinity anywhere. It's non-existent. In the Old Testament, there are Christian scholars who are stating today that the doctrine of the Trinity cannot be found in the Old Testament anywhere. This is confirmed by a man called William Lane Craig, one of the biggest debaters, uh, one of the biggest Christian orators in the world, who stated clearly on video that the doctrine of the Trinity cannot be found in the Old Testament. And arguably it can be found in the New Testament, arguably. Let's go to the New Testament. Old Testament is out of the picture. It's out. There is no doctrine of the Trinity in the Old Testament. Jews worship one God in one person. Period. That was Yahweh, Elohim, Father, call him what you like. In the New Testament, let's see if there is a doctrine of the Trinity there. Non-existent again. There is not a verse in the New Testament which gives us the doctrine of the Trinity as the Christians believe in it today. What do the Christians say? The Christians say that there is one God who is of one being, in one being, and there are three persons. And all of these three persons are co-existent, co-equal, and co-substantial. You know what that means? They have existed together, and they are equal in status, okay? And they are equal in essence. They all share one essence. Do you know what that means? This is non-scriptural, does not exist in the Christian and the Jewish scripture. These terms used by the Christians today to describe the Trinity do not exist in the scripture, in the New Testament. And there are no two opinions on this issue. The Christians, scholars themselves, they state that the terms like homoousios of the same essence do not exist in the New Testament. This in itself shows us that these terms or the description of the doctrine of the Trinity, the details are man-made. Is that clear? If they are not in the scripture, then they are not sent from, they, they weren't sent from, by, from God. And the point here is now, even if we accept that the New Testament comes from God, first of all, that's another big question. That's another big question, whether the New Testament comes from God Almighty or not. Because we don't know who chose these books for the Christians to read in the first place. Who made the canon? There were Christians reading so many books in the first four centuries. Attributed to Jesus Christ in different places, in different times, written in different languages. So many Christians reading different books in different times, in different places. And we don't know to this day who chose these four Gospels for the Christians to read as the Word of God and the Epistles of Paul. And there were so many debates taking place in the first century as to what may be the Word of God. So some people thought the Gospel of John is heretical. We don't accept it. Throw it out. Others are saying, no, the Epistle of Jude, the Epistle of James, the Book of Revelation is heretical. Then others are saying, no, the, sec the Book of Second Peter is a forgery. We don't want it. So there were different lists coming from different church fathers in the first three, century, three centuries. Origen, alive in the third century, an early church father, he had a list of books. Then Eusebius, he had his own list of books which differed from the book from the list of origin. Then we have Marcion, another church father, he had his own list of books. So all of these people, they had different canons, different lists of books attributed to God Almighty. And then this notion of the, 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 the books being inspired by God was another uh, concoction and man-made idea. People just attributed these books to God, as the Quran clearly states. In chapter 2, verse 79, for Vail Lulli Ladina Yaktabuna Kitawa be Aidihim, Thoma Yakuluna Hadam and Indila, Li Yashtarubi Thaman and Kalila. Woe be unto those who write books with their own hands and say these books are from God. Did the Christians and the Jews do that? That's, that's what they did. The canon is man made. People decided as to what may be the word of God. And, that was, and it was in the 4th century when the canon of the New Testament was established to be what it is today. And there are manuscripts from the 4th century in the British Library, here not very far, it's called Codex Sinaitic as one of the manuscripts. In this manuscript, in this manuscript they have two extra books, which cannot be found in the Bible today. So the canon was a big problem for the Christians. That's another issue altogether. So whether the New Testament comes from God or not is another question altogether, which deserves a sitting of its own. But we are not going to address that issue today. Even if we assume that it is from God, 
even then the doctrine of the Trinity is not there, non-existent, it's not there. The only verse which could be found in the New Testament to support the doctrine of the Trinity was in the first epistle of John chapter 5 verse 7 which stated that there are three that bear witness in the heavens, the Father, the Son and the Spirit and these three are one. Now this particular verse was known to be a forgery, it came to be known as a forgery in the recent years because some textual scholars who studied the early Greek New Testament manuscripts, they realized that this verse does not exist in any of the early Greek manuscripts. 1 John 5, 7, which can be found in the King James Version today, and it has been thrown out from RSV, Revised uh, Standard Version, and NIV, New International Version. This verse is thrown out, it's not there anymore. But in the King James Version, it's there, it can be found to this day. And it was added later on by another scribe to substantiate the doctrine of the Trinity when in the 4th century um, Christological controversies were going on. I can see some of you are going to sleep because maybe this is too technical for you. So brothers, stand up please for one second so that you wake up. All of you, put your hands up <laughs> and give each other a hard slap. No, 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 no. I don't mean that. Have a seat. Okay, I know this is this may be too technical, but these are very, very important Dawa points. Pay attention, and when you speak to your Christian friends, bring this to their attention and tell them how the Quran is right, how the Quran is a miracle. How did Muhammad وسلم, know that those who follow Allah and His Messenger cannot believe in the doctrine of the Trinity? And if you believe in the doctrine of the Trinity, then you don't believe in Allah and His Messengers because they never sent it, they never brought it. So you need to work on this. Because there's a dichotomy in the Quran. You either believe in Allah and His Messenger, then you don't believe in the doctrine of the Trinity. And if you believe in the doctrine of the Trinity, you cannot believe in Allah and His Messengers. It's a dichotomy. Okay? So you need to highlight this to the Christians. So now, this verse was added in the scripture to substantiate the doctrine. Then there are some other verses, for example, in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 28, verse 19, there is a verse which states that Jesus Christ told his disciples, having told them already in the chapter 15 of the same gospel, verse 24, that I was not sent to anyone but to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. He has already said that in the same gospel, the gospel of Matthew. And now in the last chapter, chapter 28, verse 19, he tells his disciples, go in the land and baptize people, nations, Gentiles, not only Jews, others as well, in the name of the Father, the Son and the Spirit. Now because of this apparent contradiction in the text, scholars such as Grant Stanton from the University of Oxford assert that this passage, the book of Matthew chapter 28 verse 19 was added later on. It's a later insertion. It doesn't exist in the text. Jesus couldn't have said that because he was a Jew and he was a law abiding Jew and that meant that his message was not for non-Jews. His message was specifically for Jews. And this can be affirmed or this can be confirmed for many different verses in the Bible. So now we face a dilemma. Where is the doctrine of the Trinity? In the, the text of the New Testament. At best, brothers and sisters, pay attention. At best, we can find a binity in the New Testament, we cannot find a trinity there. Is that clear? What's a binity? What's a binity? Two. We can see the Father there as the divine person and some ambiguous verses, vague, unclear verses may suggest that Jesus was some kind of God, divine person. Not in explicit verses. In explicit verses, he is denying his divinity. Jesus denies his, his divinity in many, many explicit verses. For example, the Gospel of John, chapter 17, verse 3. He says, Father is the only true God. Father is the only true God. In the Gospel of John again, chapter 20, 
Verse 17, he, tell, he tells Mary Magdalene, Go to my followers, my disciples, tell them, I ascend unto my father and to your father, to my God and to your God. Denial of his own divinity. When a Jewish rabbi comes to him, asks him, Father or Master, what is the first commandment? What is the first commandment? He tells him, Hero Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Ya Bani Israel, Allah Rabbi wa Rabbakum. What is in the Quran? And then he tells him, Love thy God with all thy mind, with all thy heart, with all thy soul. And the Jew says, He has spoken the truth, Master. There is no one else beside him. And the Jews worshipped one person alone. And that person was the Father. We know this from the Gospel of John chapter 8 verse 54. Where Jesus speaking to a crowd of Jews tells them that I do not glorify myself. It is my Father who glorifies me. Of whom you say is your God. So the Father with capital F is the God of Israel. The Israelites, the Jews, they worship the Father. They don't worship the Son and the Spirit. And when this Jewish man asks Jesus, what is the first commandment? He tells him, Hero Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Our God, our God. Including himself. The Lord our God is one Lord. And the Jew responds by saying, You have spoken the truth, there is no one else beside him. And who does he have in his mind? The Jew. Who does he have in his mind? Sorry? God. Which person? Sorry? The Father. Because they never worshipped anyone else. They only worshipped one person, one God. And that was the Father with capital F. And when he says there is no one else beside him, he means beside the Father. And Jesus tells him, you have spoken the truth. You are close to the kingdom of God. And now Jesus was divine himself. If he was God in flesh himself and he was a Trinitarian, this was the best time for him to tell this Jew that here... Hold on a second, you've been worshipping the Father for a very long time. Now it's a new co covenant for you. Okay? Now you worship the Father, you also worship me, the Son, and you worship the Spirit too. He didn't do that to him. He didn't tell him that. He told him, what you believe in is true. It's fine. Your concept of God is fine. And then in the Gospel of John, speaking to a Samaritan woman, a Gentile pagan woman, he tells her, that we worship what we know and you worship what you know not. In other words, idols, your idols. Okay? And remember you woman, that salvation is of the Jews. Salvation is of the Jews. The Gospel of John chapter 4 verse 21 onwards. Speaking to a Samaritan woman. So what games is Jesus playing if he's God? If he's God in flesh, if he's divine with capital D, what games is he playing? Why does he tell the Israelites openly in explicit terms, that hold on a second people, I am God, with capital G, with divine qualities. I am God, worship me. He never said that. He never said that. And then Christians will bring some examples from different places in the New Testament that people worshipped him. But again, when we go to the Old Testament, we find a number of other places where people worship other people. Other people in the Old Testament, men, not God, they worship prophets. For example, there are so many examples in the Old Testament who worship. And the term in the Greek language is uh, uh, something like proskenon or something like that, which means to worship. And this term can mean anything in the first century uh, and uh, first first century and beyond. Beyond first century, what I mean by beyond, backward, going backwards. Okay, so. This term could mean to pay respect, to bow, to worship as well. Okay? This term could mean anything in those centuries. So when people bowed to prophets to pay respect to them, they considered it worship at the time. It wasn't a big problem. What we know is Sajda Ta'adhimi. You know that? You know Yusuf alayhi salam, Joseph? In the Quran we read the story that his brothers and his father and uh, mother, they were bowing to him. Okay? I had a dream that 11 stars and the sun and the moon are bowing to him. Okay? What did Allah say to angels? Bow to Adam. And this is what we know as sajda, ta'dimi, prostration of respect. You prostrate to someone out to respect. And this was done in the, in the days, in those days. People used to prostrate to others 
to give them respect. But this was made haram by Islam so that things can be now clarified. People can have clear concept of worship and that concept is to worship God and God alone. So worship could mean anything in those days. Jesus never said, I am God with capital G, worship me. I am the one you have to worship. That didn't exist. That did not exist. So how did the doctrine of the Trinity come about? Christians had to debate. They had to debate their way out or way in to the scripture. So the first three centuries, there were two major groups of Christians. Two major groups. Unitarians, those who believed that God the Father is God Almighty and Jesus was not God. He wasn't God because he was created, he was begotten, there was a beginning to Jesus Christ, hence he cannot be God. And there was another group of Christians in minority, pay attention, in minority, who believed that Jesus was God. And according to the majority, these people were mushriks and kuffar and heretics, for obvious reasons, because they believed that Jesus was God. And the majority were Arians. In the 4th century, Arianism meant that Jesus was, he was a divine person, he was from God, but he had a beginning. For that reason, he was not God with capital G. He was an agent of God, a supreme agent of God. Hence, he cannot be God. And these people, Arians, were a follower of, they were followers of a man called Arius, who was present in the Council of Nicaea. So now in the 4th century, Arians are in majority, and those who believe that Jesus was God in flesh, were in minority. So there was a big dispute about these uh, in, in between these two groups. Constantine, he brings them on board. He says, guys, come together in a council and we will decide and we will establish one doctrine. So I want you to unite because I am the emperor of the Roman Empire and I have crushed the persecution you were facing in the reign of Diocletian and Decius and Commodus and Marcus Aurelius and Nero and all of these Roman emperors who crushed all the Christians. Heavy persecution came their way. And now I've come to power. I don't want to persecute you. I want to unite you. What do you, want, do you guys want to do? And there are opinions that he was a Christian at the time. But this is debated heavily. Whether he was actually Christian at heart or not. Because he was still minting coins at the time with the picture of the sun god. He used to worship the sun god. Saul Invictus. So now Constantine is present in this council. And these two groups come together and the majority are Arians. Majority are led by a man called Eusebius of Caesarea who was accused of being an Arian. And they were, in, they were 200 in number. And the rest were from different denominations. And minority group was from that group which believed in Jesus' divinity. So what do we do now? Having seen the debate, Constantine, he intervenes and he forces down their throats a term which is non-scriptural. He said to add the term homoousios which is an Aristotelian term to describe the essence of being. Homoousios in Greek means essence of being. Okay, So he, Constantine said, add this term into the creed and state that Jesus Christ was of the same essence of God. In other words, he's God. He's of the same essence. He shares the being of God Almighty. Okay? Is that clear? But the majority didn't agree with that. They said, no, we're not going to sign this. Then he said, those who don't sign it will be punished. So two people refused to sign the document. And the rest, forcefully, they signed it. Reluctantly signed it. And then they went away. And then they cancelled the conclusions of this council. And said, no, Jesus is not of the same message of God. He was something else. But then these conclusions were actually, they were adopted by the church later on. And then this dispute, it continued until the year 381 CE. Pay attention. This is very, very important information. Okay. This council concluded and it drafted a document known as the Creed of Nicaea. And this creed was written down because of the Emperor Constantine and his intervention. The creed was written down that... Jesus Christ is God of God, is of the same essence as God and is God. 
It's very clearly stated there. Okay? Holy Spirit, the third person in the Trinity, is not elaborated upon. And we believe in Holy Spirit. It's written there. How we believe in Holy Spirit, what is Holy Spirit, is not established. In the Council of Nicaea in the year 325 CE. So the issue of Holy Spirit is left alone, not dealt with. So what's happening now? Fourth century. Constantine now realizes that he made a mistake. Are you paying attention? He realizes that he made a mistake. What does he do now? On his deathbed, he is baptized again, or for the first time, by an Arian bishop. Constantine died an Arian, believing in Jesus Christ as a man, not God. So Jesus, Jesus Christ was not God. When Constantine died, he had that belief. Okay, so he was baptized by a man called Eusebius of Nicodemia or Nicomedia. Nicodemia, I don't know, it's a place in Turkey where this Eusebius was from, and he is the one who baptized Constantine, Constantine before he died. So now Constantine was succeeded by his son Constantius. Constantius was also an Arian. He believed that God Almighty is one and Jesus is not God because he was an Arian. But then Constant, Constantius is succeeded by a man called Julian who apostatized from Christianity altogether. He said, I am not a Christian. Because when he saw Christians worshipping graves, he wrote this in his writings. That now, the Christians of today, what they're doing, first they started worshipping Jesus Christ, some of them, and now they're worshipping graves of their martyrs and their saints. So I'm better off being a pagan than these, because there's no difference between me and them. So he went back to paganism, ancient paganism. Okay? But then he died two years later. And he was succeeded by a man called Valens. Valens was also an Arian. Didn't believe in the divinity of Jesus Christ. Roman emperors I'm talking about. Roman emperors. But these emperors didn't force their doctrine down the throats of the masses. The masses in majority are still Arians. The masses in the Christian world are still Arians. They don't believe that Jesus Christ is God. Then something happens. When Valens dies on the battlefield in the battle of Adrianople, you know a place called Adirne in Turkey? There's a place called Adirne in Turkey, which was known at the time as Adrianople. He died in this battle in the year 378 CE. And then Theodosius comes to power. Listen to this carefully. How the doctrine of the Trinity came to be established as the, as the central doctrine of the Christian church. Theodosius comes to power. And in the year 381 CE, in his reign, they have a council in Constantinople where they get together again to, to establish as to what the Christian doctrine is. What is the real Christian doctrine? So they adopt the creed of Nicaea again, that God the Father is there and God the Son uh, is there, and they are both of the same essence. They are both from the same origin, okay, same essence. Now they add the third person into the doctrine. The doctrine of the Trinity is now established and completed. The Holy Spirit is also added as the same essence as the God the Father and God the Son. Is that clear? So it was in the year 381 CE when the Holy Spirit was added as the third person in the Creed of Nicaea. So now this creed was known as the Creed of Niceno or Niceno Constantinopolitan Creed. It's known as. I don't expect you to remember this yet. This creed is known as Niceno-Constantinopolitan Creed. The first one was the Creed of Nicaea, in which two people were dealt with, the God, God the Father, God the Son, and the third person was left alone. And in the year 381 CE, 50 years later, another person was added, and this was done by three people, three church fathers, Basil of Caesarea, Gregory of Nazianzus, and Gregory of Nyssa. These three people, they are known as Cappadocian Fathers, they came together and they forwarded this idea of the doctrine of the Trinity. Not that it wasn't in existence, it was there, some Christians believed in it, but now it was established as the central doctrine of the church. And then Theodosius, Emperor Theodosius, issued laws. Pay attention. These laws are known as Theodosian Code. In these laws, in the book 16, we read, and it, it was stated, that 
Now the established doctrine of the church is that there is one God and He consists of three persons, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit and anyone who disagrees with this doctrine, even in a minor point, will be considered a heretic and will be treated as such. Okay? And first, the wrath of God will take its toll on such a person and then our imperial might will take care of him. And their, worship, their places of worship will not be given the title of being a church. Is that clear? Their places of worship will not be known as churches. So what, what's happening here? Theodosius, the emperor of the Roman Empire, has issued laws now, and these law, laws are now saying that no one is allowed to be anything else other than a Christian. Trinitarian, not Christian, they were Christian. <laughs> Trinitarian. There were Christians who were Unitarians, there were Christians who were Binitarians, and there were Christians who were Trinitarians. So, Unitarians, Binitarians, and Trinitarians. What's going to happen now? So Theodosius said, Halas, Yalla, finished. No more room for disagreement. All of you have to be Trinitarians. And if you're not Trinitarians, then you will die. And this is when books which differed, uh, uh, which differed in contents from the books um, which were known at the time, um, the, 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 the canon of the church, the Catholic church, they were systematically destroyed. So have you heard of these books found in Egypt, Nag Hammadi scriptures? Have you heard of them? Have you heard of them? You haven't? Apocryphal Gospels? Have you heard of them? Other documents attributed to Jesus Christ? There are four Gospels we know, the Gospel of Matthew, the Gospel of Mark, the Gospel of Luke, the Gospel of John, we know about these, yes? Is that clear? Yes? But there were others. Are you? Do you want me to come and <laughs> wake you guys up, yeah? Respond please, <laughs> okay. So there were other Gospels. The Gospel of Philip, the Gospel of Thomas, the Gospel of Mary, the Gospel of Judah, the Gospel of Nicodemus, and the Gospel, the Gospel, the Gospel, the list goes on. 200 documents. Where are they? Where are these documents? They were systematically destroyed by the church. Okay? And some people, because they didn't want to be caught uh, with these documents, because if they were caught with these documents, then they were to die. So they, what they did, they buried them in the sand. And in the 1940s, they found a collection of these books in Egypt, in a place called Nag Hammadi. Okay? And this collection had the Gospel of Philip, and the Gospel of Thomas, and some other Gospels. And these are the only texts we have of these Gospels extant to this day. So now, this is how the doctrine of the Trinity and the canon of the church was established. The doctrine was forced down people's throats. The Christian masses were forced into this doctrine, systematically. And anyone who disagreed, disagreed with this doctrine was simply killed off. Okay? And because the imperial might was behind this doctrine, this doctrine was forcefully you know, given to the people. And peasants, peasants, you know, majority of the Christians who were upon fitra, fitra, they believed in one God and they believed that Jesus Christ was a, was a supreme agent of God, in other words, a prophet, prophet of God. All of these people in the villages and in the fields and the farmers, they were, when they were confronted by, um, or when they confront, confronted the Roman might, they didn't have a problem in accepting the doctrine of the Trinity. To them it didn't really matter. Because they weren't educated. They didn't use study books and doctrine of the church and the scriptures. They said, okay, fine. Who cares? We still believe in Christ. We still believe in Jesus. So it doesn't really matter. So that's how the doctrine of the Trinity was spread. And then later on, what happened? The church had its firm hold on the people and the masses. So the church systematically kept the peasants illiterate. They were not allowed to read the Bible themselves. Only the elite, the clergy could explain as to what the Bible means. And every time they taught the Bible, they had to put a spin on the scripture. Every time they were teaching the Bible, oh, this verse means Trinity, that verse means Trinity. So, the people who don't study, how do they know what's what? Okay? Up to the Reformation, the 16th century, the Catholic Church was governing the society in the West. And in the Christian world, in Christendom. Is that clear? And then, 
The Reformation was about this very point that now we need to have scripture open for everyone. Sola Scriptura was the idea which was forwarded by the reformers that we don't want the church anymore. We don't want the corrupt clergy taking all our money and taxes and worshipping the Pope and the idols they have in the churches. We don't want that. We want to go back to the scripture and study it for ourselves and see what the scripture has to talk, uh, say to us. But the church was insisting that if you read the scripture without the tradition, you won't understand the scripture. So you have to have the tradition. But the reform, reformers were saying that it's because of this tradition you are oppressing the masses. You govern them. You loot them. You, know, you rob them of their money because of this tradition. You loot, pollute and do all those things. So the reformers, people like Martin Luther, Zwingli, people like uh, Calvin, all these people, they broke away from the church and they said, that's it, enough is enough, we don't want the Catholic Church anymore, we want the scripture. And then, for the first time, you know, people were allowed to translate the scripture and those who translated the scripture into their own vulgar tongues, they were punished first. You know Tyndale? William Tyndale, have you heard of him? You don't know William Tyndale? Okay. You know Wycliffe? Wycliffe. John Wycliffe. Okay, John Wycliffe, he translated the Bible into English for the first time. Okay? And he was almost, you know, prosecuted in a court and he was like deemed to be a heretic because of translating the Bible. But then he survived. There was another man in the time of Henry VIII, King Henry VIII of England, he translated the Bible into English using some of the words of Wycliffe and then he was caught on the continent, not in England, he was caught I can't remember where he was caught, I think it was in Holland, Antwerp somewhere in Antwerp, he was caught and he was burnt at stake burnt alive for translating the Bible but then the king of England himself he broke away from the church because the church wouldn't allow him to divorce okay, so he had to kill his wife you know he was killing, he was a crazy guy you know, the fact King Henry VIII, you, we've seen his pictures, yeah? Hampton Court and the, blurs, the, 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 towers, the towers of London and all of this, yeah? So what would he do? If he got married to a woman, if he didn't like her after a while, he could divorce her, you know? He had to kill her to get rid of her because the church wouldn't give him the divorce. So he would just simply accuse his wife or wives of some crimes. She was, she's an adulteress, she did this, she did that, yalla. To the dungeons. Okay? To the dungeons. And then off she goes. So this is how he was getting married and this is why he was killing women as well. Because of the issue of divorce. So he broke away from the church. He said, Kalas, I have my own church. The Church of England. And he became the supreme head of the Church of England. And then we had the Anglican Church. The Anglican Church we know yet yeah, today. Okay? And then in, on the continent, in Germany and in other places, we had people like Martin Luther and we had the Reformation and then the scripture was open for people to study. And when this happened, in the very next century, in the 17th century, we had the Enlightenment. And people when they studied the scripture, they realized that the doctrine of the Trinity is not even there. We were deceived by the church for so long. And then, there were people in the 16th century, while the Reformation was taking place, people like Michael Savitas. He was a Spaniard. From Spain, he contested that the doctrine of the Trinity is a corruption. So he wrote letters to Calvin. Calvin, who was governing in Geneva, in Switzerland, he wrote a letter to him telling him that, look, this is the time for us to wake up and tell the Christian world that the doctrine of the Trinity was a forgery, it's, it's a corruption, it doesn't exist. But they didn't listen to him. To the contrary, they caught him, they captured him, in Geneva and he was burnt at stake with his book and his book was titled uh, The Errors of Christianity okay and then he was burnt with his books and some of his books are the rarest books on the face of the earth if you find a copy of Michael Savitas' uh, Errors of Christianity you are a millionaire if you find one of those books okay but then in the 16th century there was a big movement and people like John Locke and he's like, they said, Khalas, we don't want to believe in the Trinity, it's a corruption. Then we had people like Isaac Newton writing in secret, and he said, we don't want to believe in the doctrine of the Trinity. And that's it. 
people broke away. Some even apostatized. They said, this is a man-made religion. Even the text of the Bible is man-made, it's corrupted, it's changed. We don't want to believe in it. It's not the Word of God. They knew it's not the Word of God. It cannot be from God. Hence, anything coming from it cannot be God. from God. And that's it. We don't believe in it. And end of story. This is how the doctrine of the Trinity was man-made. And Christians later on, they rejected it. And there are Christians who are rejecting it to this day. And now I will end my presentation so that you can ask questions inshallah. This is why the Quran is right. The Quran was telling the Christians this centuries ago that this is what the truth is. Do not make things up. If you follow Allah and His messengers, you will never fall into this error. You will never believe in the doctrine of the Trinity. Is that clear brothers and sisters? Thank you very much for being awake and listening to me. And now you can inshallah ask questions.